Welcome to Computer Science 320 2014 Winter 2 Midterm 2 Practice Problem Screencast. We are working on the last problem, problem number 8, and I think I'm going to try and push through this whole one instead of breaking it up into individual videos. So the problem is, I want the truth, and we've got an overall statement that for each statement below, we want to circle one answer to indicate whether the statement is always true never true or sometimes true for the circumstances indicated. So if every possibility indicated causes the statement to be true, we answer always. If none causes the statement to be true, we answer never. And if some cause the statement to be true and others cause it to be false, we answer sometimes. So let's just try out one of those statements so that that makes sense. Evaluate this statement over the possible non-empty input arrays A passed to the algorithm. The deterministic select algorithm picks the smallest element in the array as its pivot. Now, if we're really dealing with non-empty arrays, we might want to start thinking about the smallest possible non-empty array, which would be an array with just one element. But it turns out, we discussed earlier, we're going to have a base case that has at least five elements for deterministic select. So if we've got four or fewer elements, then we're just going to sort the thing with something, you know, merge sort if we have to, even though that's not a great way to sort four elements. So this is all going to be irrelevant. It won't even pick a pivot until it has a sufficiently large array. Once it has a sufficiently large array, remember, it's guaranteed to carve off more than a quarter of the smallest elements of the array. So imagine we had the elements ordered. Um, we don't usually, by the way. The array is generally unsorted when we run quick select. Uh, or deterministic select, sorry, on, on the array. If it was sorted, we wouldn't need this, right? If it was sorted, we can find an order statistic just by looking up that entry, and there it is. But imagine we did have the elements sorted. Then we eliminate about a quarter of the smallest elements and the largest elements through this process we use to pick the pivot in deterministic select. And that means the pivot can only be in this middle range. So no, we will never pick the smallest element as the pivot. That is never true. Now, on this particular question, if someone answered sometimes true and was thinking, well, you know, maybe for a sufficiently small array that could happen, uh, I don't think that's the best answer. Um, but if, if that's what you were thinking about, then hopefully you at least thought through very clearly that this could only happen when you're not in the recursive case. All right. So next up, we've got evaluate this statement over the set of all unordered arrays of distinct integers of length n greater than 1. The divide and conquer inversion counting algorithm adds more than n over 4 to the count of inversions on some step of the merge process. So remember, this inversion counting algorithm from the textbook is basically merge sort with an extra step added in. So we might divide an array in half, and then we'll sort the left half, and we'll sort the right half. And then as we merge them together, if it's ever the case that there's an element on the left half that is, so say we've eliminated all these elements in the merge, and we've eliminated all these elements, but we're up to here, and this element in the right half is smaller than the element in the last left half, then it's also smaller than everything else in the left half, and that means it's inverted with respect to everything in the left half. So we can count all of these elements at once as being inversions in the array. And that means we can certainly add more than 1 to the count of inversions in one step. Can it be more than n over 4? Uh, well, sure. What if every single one of these elements was less than the first, was greater than the first element in the right-hand array? We could add about n over 2 at a time. So we can definitely add more than n over 4. Is it the case that sometimes we might not add more than n over 4? Sure, imagine the initial array was sorted. We'll never add anything to the count of inversions. So that's one case where we don't add more than n over 4. Another case where we do add more than n over 4. And so that means it's sometimes true. Next up, let's evaluate this statement over the legal instances of the closest pair of points problem with at least four points. Every point in the input is within the two delta wide strip around the dividing line on the top level recursive call to the divide and conquer closest pair of points algorithm. So you remember, we, if we've got a bunch of points, one, two, three, four, for example, um, we pick sort of the middle point to divide the problem in half. And then we find, uh, oh, well, let's, let's have five points, because I think we get to. Uh, it says at least four points, but at least four points wouldn't even give us uh, a two delta wide strip. That's a base case. With, with four points, we just solve the problem directly. So let's have five points. <clears throat> 
we find the shortest distance on the left, and that becomes delta L. We find the shortest distance on the right, and that becomes delta R. Uh, and then whichever one of those is smaller is delta. And then we measure that delta out from the dividing line. And we make this strip along the middle. And you know we divide that into boxes. And there's reasoning about the boxes that tells us how many boxes away we have to look to see if there's anything closer than delta. And all that was really cool. Uh, but all we're worried about right now is, is it possible uh, to have every point in the input be within the two delta wide strip around the dividing line. So let's try and create that. It's, it's not the case in this example I just wrote here. Okay, so uh, the fact that it's not the case here means that this is not always true. It is not the case that every point in the input is always within that two delta wide strip. But that seems pretty improbable anyway. So I'm going to go back, I'm going to erase this, and go back and try and produce an example where they're all inside that strip Okay, so first I'll define where my sort of center point is going to be. And then I'm going to put two points on the left and two points on the right. And I'm going to put everything inside of this strip. And I think this is going to be not too hard to do because I just need to make sure that delta is really big, but everything is very close. Um, remember that this point in the middle does end up on one side or the other. So I'm going to call it part of the left side. Uh, as part of the left side, then this would be delta L. This would be delta R. Delta L is delta. It's the smaller one. And that two delta wide strip, that is huge, right? That goes way over here and way over here. And sure enough, everything is inside that strip. So it's not never true either, because it can be true, which means it's sometimes true. So that takes us to number four. Evaluate this statement over the legal instances of the closest pair of points problem with at least four points. No more than one point in the input is within the two delta wide strip around the dividing line on the top level recursive call to the divide and conquer close pair of points algorithm. Actually, uh, we've got more than one point in this example, and in the example I just erased, we had one point in the middle. That was that. There is one point that's got to be in the middle, right? That's the one that defines the dividing line. But everything else was outside of the strip. Uh, so we've got one case already that we saw where only one point is in there. And now we've got a case where more than one point is in there. So this is sometimes true, trivially. Uh, well, it's, it's not trivial. It's just that we already figured it out. OK. So next up, we're on problem five. Evaluate this statement over the instances of the weighted interval scheduling problem. Running the greedy algorithm for the interval scheduling problem on the instance with the weights deleted runs in order n log n time. The first thing I want to say here is that it's tempting to be like, wait, 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 the greedy algorithm with the weights deleted is wrong. It will produce an incorrect solution. That is not what this is asking for. It is not asking whether what we produce is even a solution at all, although it will be a solution. It'll be a feasible solution. It just won't necessarily be optimal. Uh, but that's not what it's asking. It's asking, will it run in order n log n time? And let's assume that there are n elements in the problem, n jobs. It doesn't say that explicitly, but that seems a reasonable assumption. Assume n jobs. Well then, how does that greedy algorithm work? It sorts the jobs by finish time, and then it picks the one with the earliest finish time, and it eliminates everything that conflicts with that and repeats. So that sorting process takes n log n time. And then the rest of the process just takes linear time, because you just go through the jobs and eliminate them one by one until you find the one that you're looking for. Um, so this ought to run in order n log n time. Let's just double check that that elimination, we can do that fast. So if we've got the job sorted by finish time, and we pick the first one, the one with the earliest finish time, then uh, anything after that point that has a start time before it's finish time, we're going to eliminate. So that's constant time for each of the jobs that have a start time that's too early. And then as soon as we find a job whose start time is after that finish time, we'll select it too, and its finish time will become the new cutoff. So we're going to go through the jobs in linear time after they're sorted. Uh, sorting takes order n log n time. So this is actually always true. OK, problem number six. Evaluate this statement over possible dynamic programming algorithms. So we're thinking about all of the dynamic programming algorithms out there. 
The asymptotic runtime of the dynamic programming algorithm is lower bounded by the asymptotic number of entries in the table used to actually store results. So if we actually store a result in the in an entry in the table, then it's got to take at least constant time to store that result in that entry. So we're going to spend at least constant time on each of the entries where we store a result. So if we count up the number of entries that store results, then we spend omega of that much time because that's a lower bound on the time spent. So yeah, the time is lower bounded by the number of entries. So that is always true. That's an interesting thing too because it says that we can very quickly tell something about a dynamic programming algorithm, and maybe to a slightly lesser extent a memoization algorithm because it's a little harder to tell which cells you use in a memoization algorithm. But the shape of the table tells us a lot about the runtime because we're going to spend at least constant time filling in the entries in those table, uh, tables. And once we know what the recurrence is, we can usually figure out how much time we'll spend filling in each entry in the table. So maybe it'll be constant time, or maybe it'll be linear time. And then it's usually just multiply that by the number of entries in the table, and you've got a bound on the performance of the algorithm. So finally, evaluate this statement over divide and conquer algorithms where memoization asymptotically improves their performance. Memoized, that is already calculated and stored results, are accessed omega-1 times. It is saying that we go back and re-grab results that we've already computed a larger than constant number of times. Um, you know, possibly whoever wrote the exam put this question on the practice exam because there's really two reasonable interpretations here. One is that we're talking about a particular memoized result. Will it be accessed more than a constant number of times? Another is we're looking at all the results and we're asking, will they in general be accessed more than a constant number of times? In either case, the answer might be yes, but it's very clear that the answer is true if we're talking about the whole pool of memoized results. If we never make more than a constant number of accesses to that pool, we, we can't be saving much time. Uh, we, we can be, you know, the very best case is that we save a big recursive call uh, that we would otherwise have had to make again and so that would double the runtime of the algorithm. So for, for each time we access, we're kind of having the runtime of the algorithm. It's not even that, it's not even that good. It's sort of reducing by some factor, maybe. Eh, maybe it's halving. But regardless, that would be a constant number of halvings, and that would get you down to some you know, relatively small factor, but it would still be some fraction of the original runtime. So that's not enough. We really do need to access omega-1 times if we want to asymptotically improve performance. So, I, you know, I lean towards always true on this question. I'm not super fond of the question, though, because, um, you know, like, even this omega-1, well, little omega... I mean, what if some of the time you only access a constant number of times, but other times you access a linear number of times, or a quadratic number of times, or something like that? Well, in that case, that is an asymptotic improvement. It's just not a uniform asymptotic improvement. So, um, yeah, I, I lean towards always true, but, you know, if you said sometimes true, I think that's fine, too. It's definitely not never true. This is definitely better than never true.